Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bernice Shu, and I'm a program assistant at the National Committee on US-China Relations. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us for this very important conversation. We will begin with a moderated panel discussion on the impact of xenophobic political rhetoric and anti-China foreign policy on the recent and distressing rise in anti-Asian violence and hate crimes across the United States. At around 8.40 p.m. Eastern, we will turn to Q&A with the audience. Audience members can submit questions for our two panelists anytime during the first hour by using the Q&A icon located at the bottom of your screen. Please be sure to leave your name and affiliation if possible. At 9 p.m. Eastern, Congresswoman Judy Chu, representing California's 27th Congressional District, will join us to speak about and provide an update on legislative responses to the growing attacks against Asian Americans. And with that, I now turn it over to my colleague and tonight's moderator, Erica Quach, Program Officer at the National Committee, who will introduce our two speakers. Take it away, Erica. Thank you so much, Bernice, for that introduction. And special thank you to Bernice and my colleagues working behind the scenes for making this program possible. Um, now, I'm delighted to introduce our speakers for tonight's panel discussion. Jessica Lee is a senior research fellow in the East Asia program at Quincy Institute. Her research focuses on US policy toward the Asia Pacific region with an emphasis on alliances and North Korea. Ian Shin is an assistant professor of history and American culture at the University of Michigan. Dr. Shin focuses his teaching and research on the history of US foreign relations and Asian American history. A warm welcome to both Jessica and Ian. Let's jump right into the discussion for today. Can you both in your own perspectives walk us through the evolution of anti-Asian racism during the past year? Let's start with Ian. Sure, thank you, Erica. It's good to be with all of you tonight, and I want to thank the National Committee for hosting this really important conversation. My reference point for the anti-Asian bias uh, and, and uh, racism that has happened over the last year really comes from uh, Stop AAPI Hate, which some of you uh, may have heard of in, uh, in the audience as a major organization that's trying to track these different incidents. And they record the fact that over the past 12 months, there have been 3,800 incidents of different types of anti-Asian bias uh, in the United States. And we know for almost a certainty that that is an undercount. Um, these kinds of incidents have ranged from uh, shunning, which is deliberate avoidance of people of Asian descent, to verbal assault, to at their worst, uh, physical assault and violence against Asian people and Asian Americans in the United States. Um, I think what has been most uh, top of mind for the public has been these uh, very high visible kind of physical incidents. Uh, it started in March of last year with the attack uh, on a family uh, with small children in a parking lot in Texas where uh, someone came and slashed them. Um, and then we've seen other incidents, for example, uh, earlier in the year in January, an 84-year-old Thai American man uh, was pushed uh, and died as a result of his injuries. And of course, perhaps we're all very familiar with, unfortunately, the events that happened in mid-March in Atlanta. The thing I want to say is that those are just the tip of a very large and very ugly iceberg. Those are events that we're all familiar with because of media coverage. Uh, but in fact, there have been many more incidents that include, again, verbal harassment, uh, signage, uh, and uh, acts of avoidance of Asian people. And so we've seen that consistently over the past 12 months. Well, great. I will um, also thank the National Committee for this opportunity. Thank you to Erica and Bernice and the whole team for arranging this uh, very uh, valuable event. Um, you know, just to sort of uh, pick up where Dr. Shin left off, you know, I, I do think, you know, in terms of my uh, sort of starting point uh, in the evolution of this issue, you know, I'm reminded of an image that went viral last March, uh, so about a year ago, when former President Trump, uh, his speech notes uh, showed that he crossed out the word corona and replaced it with Chinese uh, in terms of uh, talking about uh, this uh, disease. Um, and indeed, in the early days of the COVID pandemic, uh, President Trump frequently used terms like China virus uh, to describe COVID in ways that were unnecessary and frankly, incendiary. Former President Trump and his defenders said uh, that the term really had nothing to do with race uh, and that it was just they were just trying to be accurate about the virus's origin. Uh, but such approval at the highest level of US government of using terms like China virus was incredibly damaging for our community. 
Uh, it strongly associated the disease with Chinese people and indirectly all East Asians who could you know, pass for Chinese. Both the World Health Organization and the Center for Disease uh, Control and Prevention had warned against naming diseases after certain populations dating back as far as 2015 uh, due to the heavy stigma that such practice would generate on said community. Indeed, uh, the word Chinese denotes more than a country, China. Um, it also describes a culture, uh, a language, and in the case of American history, a form of othering. Uh, whether you are a fifth generation Asian American living in Hawaii or a recent immigrant. Today, we see that the racialized language of COVID has manifested itself, as Dr. Shin said, in, in ugly forms. Uh, nearly 4,000 reported, not to mention unreported cases, but 4, 000, nearly 4,000 reported cases of hate crimes against Asian Americans later. It, Asian Americans are still getting attacked, spit on, pushed, harassed, and killed. To President Joe Biden's credit, uh, one of the first things that he's, he did after taking office was to sign an executive order condemning such forms of violence against Asian Americans. And he has not used terms like China virus or Kung flu to describe the deadly pandemic. And he has rightfully called on Congress to pass laws to permanently strengthen the law enforcement aspect of this challenge, as well as data tracking capacity on hate crimes against Asians. But these are long-term solutions to a problem that is getting worse by the day. So we'll need more than words or symbolic gestures or frankly laws that will take many months to, impl uh, to pass and uh, implement uh, in order to truly tackle this growing threat to American society. Thank you both so much for that background and context. Um, Ian, can you please tell us about the history of sinophobia in the United States? How has it in the past escalated negative perceptions of and violent attacks against Asians in the United States? Thanks, Erica. Before I speak to that, I want to just touch on something that, that uh, Jessica said really quickly, which is to perhaps help us rethink the definition of what anti-Asian racism looks like. I think when we think about racism in terms of interpersonal acts, right, of either spitting or uh, assaults, um, that those seem like uh, individual actions that one person who dislikes a Chinese person or person of Asian descent may take. I think it's also helpful to think about potentially anti-Asian racism as a structural issue, um, that over the course of the pandemic, we've seen that in the Asian American community, unemployment, for example, has been much higher compared to other racial and ethnic minorities and other groups in the United States. And the reason for that, some have speculated, is because Asian Americans are concentrated not only at the top of the socioeconomic uh, spectrum, but also at the bottom. Uh, and so when, when Asian Americans are heavily employed in service industries and those industries are heavily affected, by uh, the, the economic slowdown of the pandemic, that that's also perhaps in some ways a form of anti-Asian racism. So I, I would urge all of us to think about racism not only in terms of interpersonal acts, but also in terms of its structural character. Um, as for the history of sunphobia in the United States, I think as a historian, my instinct is very much to say that there is no kind of foreordained path that there has not always been kind of hatred of China or fear of China or fear of Chinese people. And in fact, we can go back, and, and I like to do this in my classes when I teach US-China relations, uh, because I want to make sure people understand that there is a deep history of US engagement with China that goes far beyond you know, 1949 or 1979. Uh, and in fact, reaches back into early American history that the founding fathers were aware of China, in many cases, admired Chinese culture and Chinese society. That said, there was always an element of kind of suspicion and fear. We know, for example, that early Americans thought of tea, which they consumed by, uh, you know, the, by the crates, in addition to throwing it into the Boston Harbor, um, that they thought of tea as, as something that would uh, weaken Americans uh, because it would make them lethargic and uh, susceptible to despotic rule. That was kind of the association that early American uh, colonists uh, and early Americans had uh, with uh, China and Chinese products. Into the 19th century, what we see is that there was sinophobia, but it was really not directed so much as the Chinese government or the Chinese state as Chinese people. When Chinese people began immigrating to the United States in the mid 
uh, 1850s uh, as a result of the gold rush, uh, that they were in fact initially welcomed for their uh, uh, contributions to the development of the American West and for their contributions uh, to the economy, but then eventually came to be racialized as other, as economic competitors, um, as political and social contaminants to American society. In, in some of these cases, what we see is that these images of Chinese people verge on kind of monstrous um, uh, and, and kind of uh, magical, you know, forms of, of other rings. So imagining Chinese people as, as monsters with multiple hands, as octopuses, as, as uh, tigers uh, attacking white women. Uh, in, when we look at those images and compare them with images of uh, Chinese government uh, in the 19th century, the Chinese government was generally portrayed as kind of infantile and weak. And so here we see a, a split in the Sinophobia between attention to the Chinese state and the Chinese people. Into the early 20th century, I think what's interesting and what I'd like uh, folks to think a little bit more about is how, in fact, the rise of a uh, kind of modernized and militaristic Japan was in fact maybe one of the kind of first instances where the United States had to deal with a rising Asian power. And in those years, in the first decades of the 21st century, uh, 20th century, we actually see quite a bit of even sort of novels being written, for example, about Japan fighting in wars against the United States decades before World War II happened. And so we see uh, that kind of imagination happening uh, against Japan. The image of China changes from the kind of very negative depictions I talked about in the late 1800s around the time of the Second Sino-Japanese War in the 1930s. And here I think it's important to note that that image change was ushered in by people like Pearl Buck, author of The Good Earth, Henry Luce, the publisher of Time, that there was a concerted effort to change the image of how Americans looked at and perceived China. And so the images that you see from this period in the lead up to and during World War II, when China was of course the ally of the United States, um, are much more heroic, right? You see kind of the depiction of Chinese people in kind of nuclear heterosexual family units, uh, men kind of in, in military uniforms, uh, looking very, uh, uh, again, very heroic and very brave. Um, and so we see that, again, there's no sort of foreordained or innate fear of Chinese people. These are conversations that we can change uh, based on the way that uh, we manage uh, the media and media conversations. After World War II, of course, we know that in 1949, uh, that the uh, communist takeover mainland China, uh, and here again, we see another turn. Uh, and here, what we see is that uh, here, the, the, the sort of Chinese state and the Chinese people start to become conflated in terms of the threat they pose to the United States. One way that plays out is in the Chinese confession program of the 1950s and 1960s, when fear of kind of Chinese immigrants bringing communism into the United States um, as kind of double agents or secret agents um, ushered in a program run by the INS that tried to get uh, 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 Chinese immigrants who had come in under what's called the paper sun system um, because Chinese immigrants have not been allowed to enter the United States and to naturalize as citizens to get those immigrants to essentially confess to their status so that they would be regularized. Uh, and here there was a kind of conflation of Chinese immigrants with communist agents. And so we begin to see the kind of collapsing of Sinophobia in terms of a state focused Sinophobia and a people focused Sinophobia. I'll end by saying that again, Sinophobia is not the only force that has endangered people of Asian descent in the United States. Right here in my home, in my, in my state of Michigan, where I am now, uh, just down the road from where I sit in Ann Arbor in Highland Park, Michigan, a 27 year old draftsman named Vincent Chin was beaten to death in 1982 at the height of US economic competition with Japan in the auto manufacturing industry. Uh, and so again, what we see is that it doesn't necessarily have to be rhetoric or uh, attitudes against China that endangers people of Asian descent, but that because of the perception uh, of how uh, you know, a Chinese or a Japanese or a Thai person might still be kind of a generic Asian in, in public perception, um, that in those moments of contention, in those moments of international crisis, uh, we have to be careful about how we uh, uh, what we say and, and how we sort of portray uh, people from Asia uh, in order to avoid the kind of violence we're seeing today. Thank you so much. Um, Jessica, how have other communities of color been affected historically by foreign policy? Sure, um, I'll focus um, on the Muslim American community after 9-11, uh, but 
you know, as Dr. Shin said, you know, historically, uh, hatred against uh, Chinese Americans, unfortunately, uh, it, you know, is nothing new. We, we've seen this, uh, you know, as he noted, it appeared first in the mid 19th century. Uh, when the Chinese first arrived in the United States uh, and crescendoed into the 1870s and 80s during which Chinese were charged uh, as a biological threat to society, a source of uh, mass white unemployment uh, and a threat uh, to white America. And, you know, you're, uh, we saw after 9-11 Muslim Americans, uh, you know, facing uh, similar systemic uh, discrimination in the form of religious profiling as well as uh, surveillance. Uh, despite the absence of independent evidence of entrenched extremist uh, activities among uh, these Americans of Islamic faith. And this happened at a time when the political class uh, tried its best to discourage bigotry, uh, wholesale bigotry, and targeting, uh, racial targeting of, of folks, uh, you know, Americans of Middle Eastern descent. Uh, for example, six days after the 9-11 attack, President George W. Bush uh, gave a speech at the Islamic Center of Washington, D.C., where you know, he renounced bigotry against Muslim Americans. Unfortunately, uh, former President Trump uh, did little to sort of separate uh, the, the scientific uh, you know, causes and questions related to the pandemic with Chinese people, uh, and in many instances went out of his way to connect the two. Uh, all of the resentment and anger that Americans felt toward the pandemic uh, was channeled uh, toward China uh, as a result and to anyone who looked Chinese. Um, you know, some on the right have pushed back, uh, although they, they've used dubious logic uh, in order to push back against this assertion. For example, Senator uh, Marco Rubio uh, recently tweeted that Asian Americans are not connected to COVID. Uh, and that anyone with a common sense, you know, to understand anyone without common sense to understand that is an idiot. Um, but clearly, the current situation involves more than just a, co a couple of confused people. Uh, they are being enabled by people who should know better, uh, and being weaponized to further policies that make China and you know full spectrum ideological, political, economic, and military rival of the United States. It feels like you know I think to ordinary Americans, like China has become an existential threat to the United States. Um, and there's been very little debate as to how or why we got to this point. Today, uh, the Washington Post reported uh, that domestic terrorism incidents have soared in the United States, driven mostly by white supremacists, anti-Muslim and anti-government extremists on the far right. Experts at Rutgers University's Network Contagion Research Institute are warning of far right groups that are pushing dangerous conspiracy theories that blend anti Chinese tropes with fears of vaccines and a global plot to take over the world. So, all of these reasons, uh, I think, you know, for all of these reasons, I think we have uh, every right to be very concerned uh, about what is happening to Asian Americans. Uh, and, and we need to learn from history about how communities uh, who are scapegoating following a foreign policy decision uh, you know, have been treated. Uh, and, and to learn those uh, hard lessons now rather than repeat uh, the history. Um, thank you both for enlightening us on the history of all of this. Um, to shift the focus a little bit, um, Ian, can you please take us through the timeline specifically to how anti-China and Chinese political rhetoric has started since the outbreak of COVID-19 last year until now? Sure, and, and I think it's important to note that anti China or anti-Chinese Communist Party rhetoric, you know, has been around for much longer than that. Um, and, you know, sort of one of the things that, you know, was already on the scene was kind of the specter of uh, competition with China around intellectual property uh, and economic competition. Uh, and so in some ways, COVID-19 only exacerbated some of the debates and some of the discussions that had already been going on that were already very charged. And in many of those cases, there was not a great distinction that was being made between Chinese people and the Chinese government uh, or the PRC government specifically. And so I think that's one of the things that has set the table for some of the unfortunate incidences that we've seen in the last 12 months. It was one of the kind of unfortunate, uh, uh, you know, kind of overlaps of, of history that the Atlanta shootings happen around the same time that Donald Trump sent his first tweet or posted his first tweet about the China virus. Um, and it's a, a stark reminder of the human costs um, of that kind of irresponsible uh, communication and rhetoric. I think one of the things that I'm very mindful of is that 
even after President Trump left office in January of this year, um, and even as Jessica has noted, President Biden has not uh, uh, you know, adopted that same kind of rhetoric, that you still have because of the way that our government's system is set up. You still have other branches of government and you still have state and local level government where people have continued to take up this line of rhetoric and this line of, of uh, saying the Wuhan virus or saying the China virus. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, this language is not going away, unfortunately, because people are latching onto it as a way of taking a tough on China stance. Uh, and so I think one of the things that we have to be mindful of is to continue to, uh, to, to, to kind of uh, hold those who use this kind of language accountable. So one particular uh, instance that I thought was really striking was that Recently, just earlier, I think last week, the Lieutenant Governor of Ohio, um, you know, said or, or used Wuhan virus in a, a communication and actually his Asian neighbors reached out to him and said, could we sit down with you and explain why this phrase is hurtful and why it causes fear in our community. And I think that's the kind of interpersonal uh, communication and interaction that has to happen to explain to people the impact uh, of the words that they choose uh, and how that leads to tragic consequences as we saw in Atlanta. Um, Jessica, would you like to add on to that? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, as I said, you know, I think uh, President Trump's decision to repeatedly link COVID with China was deeply problematic, but uh, what also became problematic was how quickly the issue of anti-Asian hate uh, became partisan um, and systemic and widespread beyond the White House uh, through other branches of government uh, and through local uh, state and local levels, as Dr. Shin just noted. For example, uh, last September, 164 Republican members of Congress voted no on a resolution by Congresswoman Grace Meng uh, that condemned anti-Asian violence. Uh, 14 of the uh, Republican members voted um, for the resolution and 20 abstained. Uh, so again, 164 voted no, only 14 voted yes, and 20 abstained. So I think an important question is, you know, why defending Asian American civil liberties has become a partisan issue uh, that is being apparently advocated by, you know, a, a single party, uh, political party, rather than all political parties. Uh, keep in mind that last year was an election year as well. Uh, so it was a very unusual and heated year. Um, the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at California State University, San Bernardo, uh, Bernardito, um, found that hate crimes targeting Asians rose by nearly 150% in 16 of America's largest cities last year. When China uh, was routinely blamed by presidential and congressional candidates for America's ail um, ailments. So it was uh, sort of a perfect storm uh, that I think we're still uh, reeling from today. You know, fast forward to March last month uh, when the Georgia shooting took place, killing eight people, including six Asian American women. And you see sort of a wake up call, you know, among, um, you know, Asian Americans about sort of the severity of the situation, you know, and, you know, maybe it's because I'm an Asian American woman myself, uh, but that particular incident, uh, you know, uh, in Georgia uh, felt uh, particularly uh, real. And I uh, began to feel like, you know, I or people I know uh, could just be shot down, you know, walking down the street or doing whatever we're doing just for looking the way we do. Uh, I no longer felt safe, uh, you know, going out. And, um, you know, and, it, and the fact that my life didn't apparently seem to have equal value to those who were born, you know, non-Asian, uh, felt so outrageous, um, and uh, I was very angry uh, about you know the people uh, whose lives were ended abruptly uh, by a shooter um, in Georgia. Uh, when you know when I heard President Biden say that our silence is complicity uh, and that we cannot be complicit, you know I thought we're going to see some action. I, I I thought wow like this this must be it. You know this is when we're going to really turn a corner on on this issue and uh, do something um, pretty dramatic. Um, but, you know, his speech, um, you know, I think, you know, for, for all the good uh, that it had, uh, just didn't um, meet the task uh, in terms of uh, sort of the pervasive use of over the top language about China uh, that we're seeing routinely in Washington uh, and many other things we talked about uh, that has created an atmosphere of uh, deep anxiety uh, toward people uh, who look uh, Chinese. Uh, even today, most, you know, I think of what uh, are being said about anti-Asian violence is framed around civil rights, basic rights, human rights, and that makes sense to a large degree, uh, but it only goes so far. 
Um, I, I worry that th that you know narrative doesn't quite convince the people we need to convince. Uh, that you know, the, I'm talking about people who think, well, we got to be tough on China to protect our country. Um, and if Asian Americans become collateral damage in the process, well, that's too bad because our country comes first. Uh, but by making 20 million, nearly 20 million Asian Americans an enemy, we are sowing disunity and violence and making you know, uh, United States vulnerable to criticism uh, from illiberal countries uh, that will use these racial tensions and vision to de deleg delegitimize our uh, concerns on human rights abroad. So not only do we make ourselves less secure uh, by making 20 million Americans a threat to our country, we undermine our own credibility and voice and appeal abroad. I also think that we're seeing linkages now between fellow communities of color and minority groups as never before. After the shooting in Georgia, the shooting of seven people at, this, at a Sikh temple in Wisconsin, shooting of nine people at the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando, shooting of Jewish worshipers at the Trees of Life uh, building, all feel much closer to home. I think in general, you know, there's power in shared experiences. And perhaps rather than looking inward, you know, this is a moment for the Asian American community to build bridges outward. Uh, and to find common humanity in other groups uh, that we may not have uh, necessarily had close ties with before. So I do think that there's some silver lining to the current situation, but um, you know, it, it is a scary uh, moment for us. Thank you for those powerful words. Um, this transitions really well into my next question, um, which you write extensively about um, in your research, Jessica. Uh, could you share your thoughts on how U.S. foreign policy is influenced by underlying racial components? Um, for example, how U.S. foreign policy can vary depending on who has a seat at the table in the decision-making process. Absolutely. So as you noted, I've written about this topic of, you know, the anti-Asian hate crimes um, and the, you know, xenophobia uh, and, and, its, uh, and their impact on national security um, at the federal level. You know, the stigmatization of Asian Americans in government uh, and these concerns of dual lo loyalty uh, will really make it hard for patriotic Asian Americans who want to serve in government to feel accepted uh, and to do the work they need to do. And Congressman Andy Kim bravely talked about this recently in, in, uh, in a political article uh, and many others have, have spoken out. Um, and so I commend them uh, for their courage. Um, you know, I think the bottom line is when you have a monolithic you know, group of people making decisions about what's going on in the world, you're going to have blind spots. Uh, and we saw this uh, in a very stark way uh, you know, in the decisions that led to the invasion uh, in Iraq uh, and the war in Afghanistan. There are also practical challenges uh, to labeling a whole country as a threat uh, that I've written about, you know, uh, inflating China's challenge using zero sum language uh, will really make US China cooperation on issues like climate change and pandemics politically extremely difficult. As my colleague at the Quincy Institute, uh, Dr. Rachel Esplin Odell has warned, uh, such an approach could actually encourage harmful overreaction and miscalculation in American foreign policy toward China, and in the worst case, uh, force China to assume a more aggressive and revisionist posture than it otherwise would have. Instead of treating China as a dangerous threat uh, to the world order, the United States should accept the reality that the world order is really a confluence of separate and sometimes contradictory forces that govern international affairs. Much like the United States has relations with countries whose values we may not agree with, China has relations with various countries too, and various goals and agendas that it aspires to. So demonizing a country for doing what the United States routinely does around the world makes little sense to me. I think the Biden administration's interim national security strategic guidance recognizes that the United States confronts a wide range of challenges from pandemics to deepening climate emergency but it also assumes the worst about China's intention. Uh, so in my think tank, uh, we presented an alternative approach to thinking about China and East Asia, one that emphasizes stability and regional cooperation and diplomacy over endless military dominance. In other words, there are ways to manage US-China relations without marching into war. Um, I do worry that those who talk about you know, realism and engagement are cast aside in the current political environment as being too eager to cooperate with China. 
And uh, those who are, you know, quote unquote, tough on China are hailed as sort of true protector of American interests. And, you know, to be honest, you know, some of the more uh, most skeptical hawkish voices on China are Asian Americans. Uh, so just because you have racial diversity uh, doesn't mean necessarily that you have diversity of ideas and diversity of viewpoints. Um, we need right now serious debates about uh, these issues, and, and we need people who are not afraid uh, to challenge the status quo or, or introduce outside perspectives uh, you know, if we are to avoid groupthink. So I think these are the kinds of uh, things that we need to keep in mind uh, as we think about uh, diversity in, in government. And Ian, um, can you please unpack the idea of patriotism among Asian Americans, the idea of is this patriotic enough or Asian Americans as forever foreigners and the need to prove our Americanness, um, similar to what Jessica was talking about. Um, how does this tie into the violence faced by Asians in the United States? So I think the, the concept that maybe we're reaching for here would be what scholars call cultural citizenship, which is the idea that aside from kind of your uh, legal belonging in the United States, that there's also a layer of kind of social and cultural belonging that Asian Americans still lack. And in seeking cultural citizenship, Asian Americans in the past have reached for kind of patriotic messaging and or military service in particular um, as a, a way to express that. Some of the viewers on the webinar may have seen uh, how a, a local official in, I believe it was Ohio at a, at a city, hall, uh, city council meeting lifted up his shirt to show scars that he had sustained from military training uh, and asked, you know, if, if is this not American? Is this not patriotic enough? This is a kind of messaging that we've seen repeatedly in uh, US history. You, we can think back to, for example, the formation uh, of military units uh, of Korean Americans, Chinese Americans, but especially Japanese Americans who had been interned during World War II as a way to kind of stand up for and say, you know, despite the discrimination that we face, uh, we are nevertheless loyal to and patriotic to this country. And indeed, for the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, uh, which was staffed uh, by, by uh, Japanese American uh, um, service members was one of the most decorated um, in World War II and, and recognized as such. I think the thing that's important to recognize is that that kind of messaging has a limited effectiveness. Um, it falls into what we might call the model minority stereotype um, of embracing certain quote unquote positive traits of being hardworking, upwardly mobile, well-educated, professional, and we might add patriotic um, as kind of a, a, a label that the Asian American community embraces in order to fight off discrimination and racism. But what we've seen in the past is that that has never really worked. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the assailants in these kinds of incidents aren't asking, did you serve in Iraq before they attack people? Um, that's not what they care about. Uh, and so I think one of the things that we have to be careful of is how uh, the, the ways that Asian Americans maybe are, are embracing um, patriotism um, as a, a kind of shield in these situations uh, are reinforcing in many ways uh, some of the kind of more problematic um, dynamics within the Asian American community, especially the model minority stereotype. So I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for bringing up the model minority myth. Uh, we have a, an interview with Jennifer Ho and Frank Wu on our website, and I think will be circulated in a second in the chat box. So please check that out. Um, Jessica, so, so while we want to make sure to strike a balance between US-China cooperation where it is essential, um, for example, in areas of climate change or global pandemics, we also don't want to completely abandon criticism of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, so Jessica, what is an alternative to the current political approaches towards China? Yeah, Erica, thank you for that very difficult question. <laughs> but it's something that I think a lot of folks who work on this issue think about constantly. Um, so it's 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 a very appropriate that you raise it. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I agree that uh, one can be tough on China on things like human rights. Uh, and indeed, I think it's important for the United States to stand up for universal values. Uh, but first, we should remember that standing up for values start at home. Pointing fingers at others when our own house is not in order, just doesn't work. Action speaks much louder than words. And, you know, addressing anti-Asian uh, American sort of hate crimes at home uh, would project a much stronger, uh, you know, uh, image uh, of the United States 
um, as well as um, you know, support our soft power uh, and influence and appeal overseas, uh, rather than finger pointing, lecturing, and at times, um, you know, uh, give uh, you know countries uh, like China uh, that you know want to sort of um, you know uh, sort of. Uh, detract and, and kind of uh, not talk about its own, uh, you know, human rights uh, issues at home, uh, a chance to sort of shine light on us. So, you know, I think when viewed in the context of American anxiety and, you know, loss of confidence in coping with, you know, challenges that are being posed by China's kind of, you know, arrival as a great power, um, you know, I think it's really important to not fuel paranoia about China in foreign policy and domestic policy and to be more realistic um, and, uh, you know, self-conscious uh, about, you know, our, our activities here at home. You know, I think the fact that China is being increasingly viewed and portrayed as an ideological rival of the United States, uh, you know, makes it, I think, an even greater uh, challenge than, say, Japan uh, in the 1980s during the auto trade war. Uh, that conflict, you know, in, involved uh, a, a, a rising power and racial differences and racial factors, uh, but not ideology, because Japan is a democracy, right? Whereas China is increasingly being, you know, seen as a threat as a from a power perspective, uh, from an ideological perspective, and um, you know, racially uh, as a people that's very different from us. So we need to be very careful, uh, I think, to distinguish between, you know, um, the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, the Chinese people in China, the Chinese Americans, uh, and people uh, of Chinese descent. And I think we can be honest, uh, you know, about the uh, the challenges that China poses in some areas, but. You know, again, my bottom line is that we need to avoid sort of the over the top language uh, that, you know, is feeding into a hysteria. Uh, and, you know, as Asian Americans will tell you, going overboard in, in, in such way uh, can have real life consequences. And so I think, uh, you know, those are some of the things that we should do, you know, right away in terms of checking ourselves uh, and our language uh, and our policies here at home. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in. Uh, so I, I do want to get to audience questions soon. Um, but be, before we do that, I'd like to ask one more question to the both of you. And Jessica, you, you touched upon this a little bit in your previous response. Um, but the Chinese state and Chinese Communist Party do not equal the people of China. The people of China are not the same as the people of Chinese descent elsewhere in the world. Um, so how do we make sure to avoid the broad strokes of conflating the government and party? Um, Chinese and China and Chinese people, as well as people of Chinese descent. Sure, I can start and uh, turn to Dr. Shin if that's okay. Uh, but you know, as many people know, you know, U.S. foreign policy uh, does have uh, you know a human rights component, uh, and has traditionally uh, focused a lot on human rights. Um, and and I think you know over time, some have used that uh, as sort of um, uh, unfortunately, as sort of a weapon uh, to name and shame countries. And, you know, this has been effective in some ways, uh, but problematic uh, when it's overdone. Um, as my colleagues at the Quincy Institute, Michael Swain and Rachel and I wrote uh, in January, the United States, you know, we believe must as much as possible um, separate human rights promotion uh, from military, economic, and geopolitical competition. Uh, we have to recognize that punishing countries on human rights ground comes uh, with a risk of provoking backlash in the targeted countries, as well as risks undermining indigenous human rights movements uh, that are fighting for change from within uh, that we don't see. Uh, United States you know, should also avoid downplaying human rights abuses in countries such as the Philippines or India as part of a strategy to draw them uh, into an anti-China containment network. There's also ways to promote human rights in China multilaterally. Uh, whether it's with Muslim majority countries such as Indonesia or Pakistan, in order to condemn Chinese uh, abuse, say, on Uyghur Muslims. Congress can also strengthen accountability and transparency in the sales of arms sales that enable and abet repression uh, and prevent American companies from profiting from repression, such as forced labor in Xinjiang. Um, there's all, the United States can also provide, it, provide targeted support on human rights in China through a more humane refugee and asylum policy, uh, a more humane extradition policy and funding to preserve minority culture abroad. So I think these are all the ways in which we can have serious discussions about human rights, uh, but do it in a way that is much more effective uh, than we uh, tend to uh, to do right now. Thank you, um, Ian. Yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll stick to maybe, um, I, I'm less familiar with uh, human rights policy, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, stick less to, to that area and say just a couple of things on the score. 
you know, I don't think any of us here on this panel um, are naive enough to think that just stopping the use of the word China virus or Wuhan flu or Wuhan virus uh, will somehow solve all of these problems. These are systemic issues that reach back in time that are rooted in uh, fundamental kind of uh, inequalities in American society. And so in some ways, they're just the latest iteration of what we've seen over and over again. But I do think it's important to speak carefully and precisely when you're trying to diagnose a problem. And so if we're thinking, for example, of the China Initiative at the Department of Justice, right, and the naming of various kinds of policies, right, how specific do we uh, make those names? How specific do we identify these threats so that they don't uh, lump in large numbers of people? Um, and I think that's one thing to think about. The other would be uh, in the realm of kind of more popular culture. And here I'm thinking again about the ways that uh, uh, in, in the past that popular culture makers have been able to shift the conversation. I think one of the things that I also am uh, encouraged by is that there has been increasing representation of Asian American stories in popular culture and popular media. And that matters because again, of cultural citizenship as more Asian American stories are seen as everyday American stories, there's less of a conflation or confusion between China and Chinese people or people of Chinese descent in the United States. And so I would also call for that uh, and, and encourage folks uh, to um, seek out those stories uh, and, and to engage with them. Great, thank you so much. Um, we're turning it over to audience questions. We have a question from Dan Stevenson and I'd, I'd actually really like to hear what you both have to say in response to it. Um, he says, it appears to me that much of the anti-China rhetoric we've seen recently is based on mis or disinformation and a lack of general knowledge about China and its intentions. We also appear to have a deficit of Chinese language and culture experts in national security organizations. How does K-12 Chinese language, and might I personally add Asian American history learning in the United States, benefit our economic and national security situation now and in the future? Um, Jessica, would you like to respond to this first? Yeah, th that's a great question. Um, I, you know, completely agree with, you know, sort of the premise of the question there. And, you know, I do think that, um, you know, as Dr. Shin repeatedly said, you know, part of it is just knowing our history. And, you know, Asian American history is just so hidden um, that it, it's just not part of the American consciousness, um, certainly not to the degree, uh, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, the struggles of the Black uh, American community, for example. Um, and, you know, I agree, um, you know, if we were to, you know, double down on sort of the educational, um, you know, programs and uh, not just, you know, learning of different languages and encouraging people to, to travel and, and, and learn about various cultures that could, you know, also open people's minds, uh, that, you know, we just do a little bit uh, more uh, and a better job of, of uh, you know, sharing uh, the Asian American history, um, you know, to American uh, people. Um, I think that would go a long way uh, because, you know, I mean, perhaps it's because of the painful uh, struggles and, and the chapter of the Japanese, uh, you know, American internment. Uh, but, you know, there is, I think, you know, at, at a subconscious level, some hesitance and, and reluctance for Asian Americans to speak too loudly, you know, in, in some ways, I mean, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but, some, you know, a lot of times I don't want to advertise the fact that I'm Asian American, you know, I don't, you know, I don't have an accent. I mean, these are all things that, you know, I think we sort of, um, you know, have worked really hard to uh, assimilate and, and, and you know, um, be seen uh, as, you know, just American, not, not a hyphenated American. And so there, there are some inherent, I think, um, challenges that our community has to grapple with. But, you know, I, I agree that, you know, investing in more educational uh, programs, you know, not just at the college level in terms of Asian American courses, which, by the way, we don't have enough of, uh, but, you know, uh, you know, earlier on uh, that, that our stories are incorporated in history books more prominently. Uh, and that we have more Asian American public, you know, figures and, and speakers who are out there, um, you know, in mainstream media, uh, writing books, you know, doing the things that, you know, other communities do to educate the public, I think would be really helpful. Ian, I wanted to ask you this question next, um, because of your background as an educator, but also I wanted to ask an additional question and, and a related one. Can you also talk about the importance of keeping our university campuses open and inclusive to foreign students? 
Absolutely. And, and I appreciate both of you um, speaking up for my, my little uh, field of academic study of Asian American studies and Asian American history. Um, there are movements around the country to incorporate Asian American history and ethnic studies more broadly into K-12 curriculum. Uh, there are movements afoot in Illinois, in Connecticut, in New York State. It's already happened in California. And so I would, I would encourage folks who are seeking to establish greater understanding uh, and empathy for the Asian American community in the United States to support those movements and perhaps start them in your own communities if you don't see that conversation being had. I think in the context of kind of higher education, which is Erica, your question to me, that's sort of a follow on that goes beyond Dan's question about K-12. You know, I think there was some, among my kind of uh, colleagues, there was real consternation I think last year when we heard that the Fulbright program was being ended to China, I think one of the things that we have always kind of uh, counted on is that sometimes when diplomacy breaks down or when foreign policy apparatus is not quite, you know, doing what it needs to do, that that people to people diplomacy, interpersonal diplomacy, cultural diplomacy programs um, have have kind of been the the safety net, um, and and in many cases historically. They've in fact helped to pave the road for you know kind of later uh, changes uh, in formal diplomacy. Um, I'm thinking, for example, of, of uh, the case of ping pong diplomacy in the 1970s as just one example, where informal changes exchanges between the United States and China can really pave the way for something more and for greater understanding. And so, um, I, I fully support and hope that there is continued uh, kind of. Um, you know, uh, a welcome uh, that's extended both uh, in China to U.S. scholars, but also in the United States to Chinese international students. Um, I think, you know, that's it's good for university budgets. I think that I'm, I'm under no kind of, um, you know, uh, pretension that that doesn't that doesn't matter. I think that has, in fact, been a major kind of economic driver for colleges and universities in terms of tuition. But more important than that is the understanding uh, the cross-cultural understanding that we can sustain through these kinds of exchanges and programs. Thank you. Um, moving on to another question from Anonymous. Um, can the panelists comment on how long existing cultural stereotypes of Asians, hive-minded, robotic, and lacking individuality have helped misinform policies as it relates to Asian Americans and their susceptibility to divided loyalties? Yeah, I suppose yeah. perhaps I can start. Yeah, on please this do. One. I mean, I, I think we, we talked about this a little bit earlier, both Jessica and I did, uh, in terms of the stereotypes uh, of Asians that have risen up uh, around, uh, you know, both the, the late 19th century and then forward to today. You know, a, a lot of the kind of stereotypes that we saw were about the kind of uh, ability of Asians to work for very little money and therefore uh, live at a very low standard of living. Um, this was kind of the stereotype that grew up around Chinese laborers as economic competitors in the late 1800s that then bled into the, the realm of seeing them as disease vectors, right? That in, in places like Honolulu and San Francisco, when there were disease outbreaks at the turn of the 20th century, in ways that are very reminiscent of what we see now with COVID-19, the white community around them kind of either tried to quarantine the entire Chinatown community, which often didn't work, or in some cases uh, uh, tried to destroy uh, that community uh, or to remove that community. Um, all of that is tied to, again, sort of these perceptions of Asian people as being willing to live in squalid conditions, not you know, being healthy, uh, being willing to eat you know, weird and disgusting things. Uh, and I mean, again, that's something, that's another stereotype that we've seen crop up again uh, within the last year. And so I, I think that has been one of the kind of uh, longstanding um, uh, uh, stereotypes that the Asian American community has had to combat um, over the last 150 years. Um, and unfortunately, it's still very much with us. Um, another question from Michael Chen, a young ambassador at the Carnegie Xinhua Center for Global Policy um, and a student at Brown University. His question is, what would it take for other minorities to support the Asian cause during the Stop Asian Hate Movement? How do we avoid lukewarm support from individuals who have experienced equally unfair treatments? Ian, would you like to try this one? Sure. I mean, the first thing I would say that 
is that I, I do think there has been support from other minority communities during this moment. Um, you know, in some of, after some of the uh, incidents of physical violence against especially Asian American elders in places like San Francisco and Oakland, there have been multiracial coalitions that have uh, popped up to protect those communities. People have formed uh, community patrols um, that uh, draw upon you know, folks who are Black and Latinx, uh, as well as Asian American and white, uh, in order to kind of uh, protect, especially the most vulnerable members of the Asian American community in those cities. And so I think there has been uh, actually a, a good deal of interracial organizing and solidarity in the wake of the uh, stop API um, hate kind of movement. Uh, I think one thing, again, as a historian, I'm fond of recalling all of the moments in which Asian Americans have reached out and other groups have reached back um, in uh, moments of solidarity, um, uh, whether it's the, the work of people like Yuri Kochiyama um, and, and Grace Lee Boggs in the Black Freedom Struggle, um, or Larry Itleon, who was a Filipino uh, labor organizer who partnered with Cesar Chavez in order to form the United Farm Workers Union. Um, but you have many examples that we can look to in the past for collaboration between communities of color in the United States. And again, not to, you know, kind of beat a dead horse, but the more we learn about this history, I think the more we see alternatives to the kinds of possibilities that we uh, may be sort of limited in perceiving based on what we understand from current experience. So I, I hope that uh, folks will take a chance to kind of learn more about these uh, different interracial uh, solidarity movements. Um, you know, for example, I talked about Vincent Chin um, and, and the, the way that he was beaten to death uh, in, in 1982 near Detroit. Some of the first folks to support Asian Americans' calls for uh, justice uh, in that moment were uh, members of the Black community. Jesse Jackson came to Detroit. Um, the NAACP was really helpful in helping Asian Americans to fight for federal civil rights uh, protections um, in the early 1980s in the aftermath of the Vincent Chin beating. So um, I, I think that there are lots of, in fact, examples, both past and present, that we can look to and build upon uh, for interracial solidarity in the wake of these attacks. Jessica, I'm sorry, I had cut you off. No, no, I, I, I would just add that, you know, I think it's always better to build relations when you don't need them. Um, and some minority communities do a much better job than, you know, we do uh, in the Asian American community. Um, you know, while we don't have, you know, sort of Al Sharpton or name your public figure in the African American community, you know, who is on camp, you know, on TV sort of moments after some sort of crisis occurs in the, in the African American community, you know, we don't have that, uh, but we, you know, I think have other things, um, including a, a very uh, socially and historically aware uh, Gen X, uh, Gen Z community, uh, young people, um, you know, as an older millennial, <laughs> I feel like you're my future and I, I need you to, you know, really do well. And I, I have so much hope for um, the, the generation right uh, that's coming right after me because, you know, they are so um, seeped in, in sort of the critical thinking and asking of the questions that, you know, I think uh, folks, um, you know, perhaps in my generation, you know, we're, we were so busy sort of dealing with the financial crisis and, you know, having a job and just, you know, dealing with stuff that I, I you know, I don't think we have really been as sort of um, aware uh, of, of the role that we can play uh, to be, you know, uh, a positive force for change. And I do think, you know, Greta Thunberg and others who are coming up are saying, you know, some of these things can't wait, like we will do this work. And I think that's so admirable. And I hope that, um, you know, that will uh, transcend racial and ethnic, you know, boundaries. Uh, and that Asian Americans will really, um, you know, uh, do away with this insidious and false model minority myth uh, and embrace the fact that as people of color, uh, we have more in common, you know, with uh, African American and Latinx, you know, community members, um, you know, than we think. Uh, and I think those relationships and uh, those, um, you know, common, um, you know, experiences uh, make us stronger uh, and I think make us much more prepared for you know, attacks um, that are, you know, caused by, you know, folks on the far right. So I think this is the moment and, and we should, uh, you know, really take that task on seriously. Um, the next question is from somebody who's directly employed in the U.S. national security field. 
um, who is wondering if the panelists can comment about how anti-China messaging and policies can bleed into security clearance policies that hurt our abilities to use the cultural and linguistic talents to monitor, report, and rebut PRC activities. Um, Jessica, can you address this question, please? Sure. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, this is a very complex issue because on one hand, you know, uh, folks who have cultural linguistic skills, um, you know, have a certain perspective that I think is incredibly enriching. Uh, and, you know, at a, in an era where, you know, Asia, Indo-Pacific region has become sort of the dominant region, uh, you know, that we're focused on as a, as a uh, foreign policy kind of, you know, apparatus and, and government, you know, it makes sense to recruit people with those skills, uh, you know, with native fluency in languages, with years of lived experience in places like China and Japan and Korea, et cetera. Uh, it just makes common sense. But on the, the it's a double-edged sword, uh, as the questioner, I think, implies, because, you know, if you have too much of it, <laughs> then you're sort of deemed, you know, so sort of suspect. It's like, well, are you sort of not American then? Because you, you, you have like lived, you know, lived abroad for so long, you know, and, you know, maybe you just, you know, come across as somebody who is a little bit too uh, kind of balanced, um, as silly as that sounds. And so it, it you know, I think it is a challenge. Um, so, and it's a, it's a dance. Uh, and I think, you know, as the questioner, you know, points out, there are implications from security clearance perspective as, you know, uh, folks have uh, written about um, and, uh, you know, there are also uh, implicit bias uh, and discrimination against folks who, uh, for example, you know, I'm, I happen to be, you know, born in South Korea. so. You know, maybe uh, I won't be able to ever work on Korea issues. You know, if I worked at State. Um, I mean, these are I'm just sort of inferencing based on you know articles that I've read and and stories that I've heard from you know current diplomats and um, you know that process uh, is just so opaque in terms of you know um, security clearance and you know uh, the due diligence that goes on and uh, I think it really unfortunately puts people in a bind. It's like, well, you want these specialized, hard to learn language skills like Mandarin. Uh, which is much, much, much harder than learning, say, Spanish, but then I'm penalized for knowing Mandarin and and having traveled as a Peace Corps volunteer or as a Fulbright. So which is it? You know, what do you want? Um, and so I think U.S. government needs to be clearer uh, in terms of what constitutes, you know, the right amount of uh, knowledge and expertise, uh, and to not mislead people. You know, if if it if it's going to hurt you to live so you know so many years abroad. Well, it'd be good to know that, you know, um, and so I think it's deeply unfair uh, to be both, um, you know, perceived as as having attractive skills, uh, but also discriminated uh, or prevented from doing jobs that you're uniquely suited to do. Uh, and so I think that's on the government of the United States to 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 do, um, you know, to do better on. Thank you. Um, I think we only have time for one last question, and this is more general. And I think we've touched upon it here and there, but would love to hear you both um, summarize your thoughts on this one. Um, how would you, so this question is from Robert Ma at M. Moser Associates. How would you advise Asian Americans to take action to address hate, bigotry, and violence? Well, I mean, I'll just quickly say that, um, you know, supporting educational initiatives like this is so important um, because we're, we're not having these kinds of discussions nearly enough. Um, and I think, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I would encourage people to really think outside of silos of, well, you know, this is a civil rights issue, it's not really tied to foreign policy or, you know, and, and I think that's really dangerous uh, because right now, as I said, we're experiencing sort of a perfect storm of a bunch of different factors uh, that are really uh, fueling uh, intense uh, resentment uh, toward Asian Americans. And so it's not gonna be, you know, sort of a, a, there's not one silver bullet, right, in which you can kind of eradicate everything. Um, and so the more we can have these kinds of conversations of academics like Dr. Shin and practitioners of, you know, policy like myself, Congresswoman Chu, you know, the more we do that, the more we learn and the sharper we get. And, and I think that's um, very important for the kinds of arguments we need to make in front of people who need to be persuaded. Because right now, you know, we're way past the point of like, don't you see this is an important issue? It's more like, we need advocates and we need people to wake up uh, and really help, uh, you know, uh, turn the tide uh, against this uh, very dangerous, um, you know, and uh, over to top reaction to, um, you know, the, the linkage between China and COVID and uh, make sure people of power and influence see 
uh, that this is having a, an immense secondary order of impact on our community that um, you know people can't look away anymore. Thank you. Any last words, Ian? Yeah, I, I have really appreciated the um, questions from all of our uh, viewers tonight, um, and I really do have, have appreciated, as, as Jessica said, the ability to have this kind of cross-disciplinary conversation with somebody who is in the world of policy, later Representative Chu is coming. I think in terms of advising Asian Americans to take action to address hate, bigotry, and violence, I think one of the things I would say is to go back to what I said earlier about some of the strategies that we know have failed, um, that certain kinds of messages and certain kinds of um, sort of branding the Asian American community as well behaved, um, as uh, you know, willing to put our head down, to work hard, uh, and that individual effort will somehow kind of save us all from systemic racism and white supremacy um, are, are, are not strategies that have worked in the past and they're not gonna work in the future. And so organizing uh, and, and sort of standing up, raising your hand, uh, joining some of these movements, I think is a, is, is a big part of what we need to do um, and to do it in a way that isn't just looking after the interests of the Asian American community. I really appreciated what Jessica said, which is it's really better to build these coalitions before you need help. And there are you know, kind of reckonings that the Asian American community I think really need to have internally uh, about, for example, anti-Blackness um, and, and to have those difficult conversations um, so that it is in fact um, a, a coalition that Asian Americans are part of that can address the underlying root causes uh, of xenophobia and racism that have led us to some of the incidents we've seen over the past 12 months. Thank you both so, so much. Um, this was incredibly informative and surpassed my expectations. So thank you both so, so much. Um, before we begin the next portion of tonight's program, I would also like to highlight the National Committee's anti-racism resource page, which you can find circulated in the chat box. Um, I will now hand it over to Jessica to introduce Congresswoman Judy Chu. I hope you all enjoyed the rest of the program. Jessica, over to you. Great. Thank you, Erica. Uh, well, it's my great honor to welcome and introduce Congresswoman Judy Chu who really needs no introduction. <laughs> um, so I have a very easy job. Um, she, of course, is the uh, member uh, who represents California's 27th Congressional District. She uh, was the first Chinese American woman elected to US Congress in 2009. She currently chairs the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, KPAC, uh, which advocates for the needs of, and concerns uh, of the AAPI community. Congresswoman Judy Chu has been working tirelessly to advocate uh, and, and raise awareness about uh, the dangers of uh, anti-Asian uh, uh, racism through legislative vehicles, uh, including um, you know, before the pandemic um, in introducing bills like the No Hate Act in Congress to help uh, combat the rise in hate crimes across the country, as well as the bicameral No Ban Act uh, to repeal President Trump's Muslim ban, as well as lead uh, many other uh, important if, uh, legislative, uh, you know, um, uh, bills and, and solutions that I hope we'll get into today. So Congresswoman Chu, thank you for taking the time to join us uh, at this hour. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes. And yes, I really appreciate that wonderful introduction. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Judy Chu. And as chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, or what we call KPAC, I'm so honored to be part of such an important conversation on what we can do to stop Asian hate. And I want to especially thank the National Committee on US-China Relations for hosting this. Last month, our nation was shocked and horrified by the murder of eight people in Georgia, including six Asian women. In response, I organized a congressional delegation to Atlanta to be with the AAPI community during this difficult time and meet with the victims' families. And we went there for a purpose to follow the murderer's steps to show how deliberate he was in targeting three Asian owned spas. Starting at the site of the first shooting named Young's Asian Massage, we then drove 27 miles as the shooter did until we arrived at two more Asian spas that were next to each other where he continued his murderous spree. Local sheriffs have tried to diminish those crimes by saying the shooter had a sex addiction and a bad day, but he had plenty of other places to go to in those 27 miles. Instead, he chose three places where there would be no doubt that Asian women would be, would be killed and 
There is no doubt in my mind that these shootings were a hate crime. And I've written a letter to the Department of Justice urging them to investigate it as such. Nothing could be more deliberate and intentional. Um, the shooter's action shouted hate when he targeted these locations. He viewed the victims as nothing more than their race. But I found out by meeting with the victims' families that they were so much more. Through their tears, they told us their loved one stories. These were hardworking mothers and grandmothers, some were in their 50s, 60s, and as old as 74, who were simply trying to support their families. Xiao Jia Tan was an immigrant from China and the owner of Young's Asian Massage and a mother who worked over 12 hours a day, six days a week to provide for her family. Her daughter, Jamie, spoke to us through tears about how unfair it was that her mother's life was cut short. Young Ayu was a mother and grandmother who loved to cook Korean food and sing karaoke and made sure her two sons graduated from college. While these shootings were shocking, they were also not a surprise to many of us in the Asian American community because anti-Asian violence has been on the rise since the start of the coronavirus pandemic over a year ago. In fact, since the start of the pandemic, there've been over 3,800 reported anti-Asian hate crimes and incidents, which increased with Donald Trump's usage of the terms China virus, Wuhan virus, and Kung flu, fanning the flames of xenophobia. The attacks were only getting worse with increasingly violent assaults, some fatal, targeting older and more vulnerable Asian Americans. Earlier this month, we saw the video footage of a 65-year-old Asian American woman in New York City who was brutally attacked while she was walking to church. We also saw that earlier in the year, 84-year-old Mitchell Ratana Pakti was just taking his morning walk in San Francisco when he was assaulted and in fact murdered. These anti-Asian hate crimes have become almost a daily tragedy, leaving many Asian Americans wondering will I be next? That is why we in the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus took actions all of last year with press conferences, statements, and letters to the White House to protest President Trump's terminology. And once President Biden was elected, we urged him to take strong action to address this surge in anti-Asian hate. What a difference that made to have a different president. We're so glad he responded. Within his first week in office, President Biden issued a presidential mem memorandum to address anti-Asian hate that instructed the Department of Justice to meet with the API community in finding solutions and combating hate. And in fact, we've already met with them. And two weeks ago, President Biden announced additional actions that he's taking to keep API safe. We've been doing a lot of work in Congress as well. Immediately after the shootings in Georgia last month, we asked for and got a hearing in the House Judiciary Committee on anti-Asian hate, the first congressional hearing on this topic in 34 years. We called for a virtual National Day of Action and Healing on March 26 to stop Asian hate, where we reached over 1 billion online interactions and had the participation of everybody from the president, vice president, celebrities and athletes, um, corporations and grassroots community groups. And we are working to stop hate crimes from a legislative standpoint. Our laws are clearly not suited to this moment. And that is why we are pushing for Congress to pass the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act and the No Hate Act. These two bills will help provide more resources and support needed to track and respond to hate crimes and to keep our community safe. The Senate version of these bills are actually being entertained on the floor this week. The House versions of these bills are actually being marked up com in committee next week. But the problem of anti-Asian xenophobia and prejudice extends beyond just the past year. Even before the coronavirus began, we were seeing the rise of anti-Asian xenophobia through the use of Cold War rhetoric that has become increasingly prevalent 
as tensions between the United States and China escalate. And while this was not unique to the Trump administration, we saw how anti-China sentiment worsened as Donald Trump looked to shift blame and stoke nativist anger throughout his presidency. One of the most dire impacts of this increased anti-China rhetoric has been an increase in the racial profiling of Chinese American students, researchers, engineers, and scientists, and even federal employees who've been wrongly accused of being spies for China simply because of the way they look. They are people like Temple University Professor Xiaosheng Chi and NOAA hydrologist Sherry Chen, both falsely accused by the FBI of being spies for China, only to have their charges dropped without any explanation. They faced humiliating arrests and had their entire lives turned upside down as a result of these false accusations, and they are still seeking justice. But they are not alone. Under the Trump administration's China initiative, we saw more and more Chinese and Chinese Americans become fearful that they would be the victims of racial profiling as tensions between the US and China continue to rise. That is why it is so important that we're doing everything we can to ensure our nation's leaders don't perpetuate harmful Cold War rhetoric. And that's why last summer I sent messaging guidance to every member of Congress urging them to avoid using Cold War style rhetoric around China and to stop stoking xenophobia that puts Asian Americans at risk. I did this because while we should absolutely acknowledge our differences with the policies of the Chinese Communist Party, we should not blanketly target all Chinese people and promote China bashing that puts Asian American lives at risk. In the meanwhile, let me say, I've spoken to so many audiences in this past period, and this is what I tell them. If you know somebody who is a victim of a hate crime or incidents, please urge them to overcome their fear and report that crime to the website Stop AAPI Hate. I urge them to empower themselves by taking bystander intervention training, which teaches the five Ds of distract, delegate, direct, delay, and document. And I urge them to continue speaking out to stop Asian hate and to stand together with allies. By standing together, we send a powerful message that everybody is to be included in the United States of America. So thank you again for addressing this important problem today. And I look forward to discussing it with you further. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Chu, uh, for your strong words and for your uh, tireless uh, advocacy on this issue. Uh, rather than open up for q and I just had a couple of questions to uh, kind of help dive into the elements you just laid out. Um, you know, first, uh, you just spoke very forcefully about, um, you know, how U.S.-China relations uh, has been deteriorating rather rapidly uh, in recent years, though this is by no means uh, ahistorical in the sense that, you know, we've seen tensions uh, between the two countries before. Um, and there is recognition that, you know, former President Trump's rhetoric and language on, on COVID and China um, and, and the blaming of China for the pandemic has really contributed to a surge in anti-Asian racism and hate crimes you just talked about. Um, you know, the heated language, um, you know, is pitting Asian, uh, uh, pitting Americans against each other, uh, mm -hmm. which in turn makes us vulnerable uh, to criticism from other countries as well as weaken our own national security. And, you know, clearly there are problems uh, with China and no one is making excuses for it. Uh, but there needs to, we still need to tone down our language uh, rather than create hysteria and xenophobia, as you just mentioned. You know, last spring at my Think Tank Quincy Institute, we talked about this issue with you. Um, and, you know, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about, you know, how you see uh, the rising attacks against Asian Americans uh, beyond a civil liberties perspective, but, you know, also as a national security issue and a foreign policy issue. Well, one thing we know, when there's rhetoric that blanketly casts a country as an enemy, it will spill over. And there will be blaming and targeting of Asian Americans. And unfortunately, we see this trend building over the last couple of decades. Um, over the last couple of decades where uh, the US has come to view China as an economic and political adversary, similar to how Russia was viewed during the Cold War. 
And so, yes, this occurred in both the Obama and the Trump administration. There were those incidents that I talked about uh, of these Chinese American scientists being profiled as spies for China, despite the fact that there uh, was no evidence against them. But this, of course, especially increased during the Trump administration because um, of his desire to divert attention from his own relationships with Russia, because of his desire to shift blame and uh, anger away from his own flawed response to the pandemic. Hence, he used the terms Wuhan virus and China virus and Kung flu, despite the fact that the CDC and the World Health Organization said not to use it because of the stigma that it would cause those from those ethnicities and geographical locations. And in fact, we know there is evidence that once he started using that terminology, there was tracking of the anti-Asian hate language on Twitter during those months of March when he started using those terms and there was a 900% increase of anti-Asian hate words on Twitter. So yes, I believe that that was directly responsible for the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes and incidents. Um, and it goes counter to what we need to do in this world. It is counterproductive to US scientific advancement uh, and actually US economic progress. Uh, there has been a strong history of cross-country collaboration in the sciences, but now this is damaging that kind of collaboration and our advancement in the world. Well, of course, my concern is with civil rights and with uh, stopping the profiling. And uh, what I do in every occasion that I can is to raise the issue of racial profiling of Chinese scientists and engineers um, and of uh, the need for civil rights. Um, and I've done this in meetings, even with the FBI, I've had numerous meetings where the FBI and the intelligence community, I mean, I've heard with my own ears how they are targeting uh, Asian Americans and basically saying to nearly all corporations and universities, watch out for them. And that's when I raise the issue of uh, what about civil, the civil rights? And uh, are you actually targeting everybody who just has a particular ethnic look? Um, so I think it's very important for us to be raising our voices on this, this issue because it is very, very dangerous. I also think that we have to raise our voices with regard to how the rhetoric is expressed. And um, especially during campaign periods, rhetoric can get very heated, uh, but we have to raise our voices to those who will hear us that you can disagree with the policies of a country. Certainly the US and China has certain disagreements that are, you know, that, that are very stark, but uh, differentiate that between that of policy versus the people and um, make sure that there is that, that um, differentiation as you are going forward. That's very helpful. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, you know, I, I wanted to, uh, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, what you laid out earlier on the House Judiciary Subcommittee uh, on Constitution and Civil Rights hearing, and I was uh, struck by, um, you know, Congresswoman Doris Matsui's testimony in which she talked about the 120,000 uh, uh, Japanese Americans who were interned during World War II, uh, and how quickly the country institutionalized racism against Americans of Japanese descent. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled that the internment of Japanese Americans was, of course, unconstitutional and not justifiable based on security. Uh, it was a policy driven by fear and racism. 39 years ago, at the height of the auto trade war with Japan, a Chinese American man that, you know, I know you, you, this, you, I know, you know this history quite well, Vincent Chin, of course, was beaten uh, to death in Detroit because people thought he was Japanese. And so as the United States copes with, you know, anxiety and, and sort of loss of confidence that might be, you know, related to a perceived threat of China, do you worry that history might be repeating itself? And if so, what would treating the almost 20 million Asian Americans in this country as a threat due to our national uh, fabric? So yes, 
I worry about history repeating itself. Uh, but I do see a qualitative difference between then and now. And that is why I have such, uh, such dedication and energy around making sure that we have Asian Americans in influential positions throughout all of society. And that is um, in local, state, and federal office, in uh, judgeship positions, uh, in as heads of corporations, um, and uh, as influence makers, whether they are actors or, or um, athletes or musicians. Uh, we have to have Asian Americans in all these arenas. Now let's look just at what happened uh, during the internment camps. Were there any Asian Americans in, con in Congress? No. Um, so in terms of political power, we were invisible. We were non-existent. And even going up to the 1980s, which is so well, he uh, died in 1982. Even going to 1982, how many Asian Americans did we have in Congress? We had only about three or four. Well, today we have 21 Asian Pacific Islanders in Congress. We have so many more Asian Americans that have been elected to local and state offices. But I know now having been in Congress that when you are there as a policies are being made, there is a substantial difference. You are there to say, this bill needs to go through this committee and this bill needs to go off the floor. And you are there to say, you know, we need a judiciary committee hearing on anti-Asian hate crimes. I mean, the one that we had was the first one in 34 years. There weren't others to say that. Um, we need Asian Americans to raise the issue of racial profiling. I know that I myself have watched out at every hearing of the National Defense Authorization Act to see whether there are ugly anti-China amendments that go through that will take away the civil rights of all Chinese people here in the United States. And I have done my best to stop it. It's when you are there that you can stop the worst things from happening. And so the fact that now we do have Asian Americans that are in Congress, that are uh, judges, that uh, now are uh, as high as the uh, DC Federal Court of Appeals and, and we have now um, the highest number of federal Asian American judges ever. Now that we have influencers that are um, corporation heads and, and uh, also actors and, and uh, uh, otherwise famous people, we see a qualitative difference. I have been so amazed at the response to this latest spate of violence and the Georgia shootings. I have never seen anything like this in terms of the response of the entire nation. It's like the entire nation woke up. But if you look at it, how did they wake up? Well, you had famous actors like Daniel Day Kim give a $25,000 reward for anybody who could find the perpetrators of the crimes. You had us speaking out. You had a billion people using their tweets and sending their tweets to others. You had vigils and rallies going on, it seems in, in every city of this nation and not being organized just by Asians, but by people of other ethnic races. And I was just so impressed to attend a few which were very multi-ethnic. People see that there's something wrong here and that that's what you have to do. You have to organize them, but you also have to inspire them. And now they are inspired to do something about this. So we, I believe are in a very different state of mind in this country. And I think that um, people are willing regardless of their background to stop Asian hate. That's very encouraging. Um, I, I know we only have five minutes left, so I'll uh, quickly move on to the next question. And um, you know, you talked about how President Biden has called on Congress to pass 
uh, the uh, COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act uh, in order to improve the reporting of anti-Asian crimes. And, you know, I wondered, you know, if what outside groups can do to build greater bipartisan support uh, for such measures since, you know, that passage uh, in the Senate might, you know, will, will likely require re Republican support. And, you know, sort of on a, um, sort of from my uh, kind of foreign policy perspective, I do worry that the civil rights uh, argument that, that you and others are making very forcefully uh, might not resonate with some folks on the right. Uh, and that pointing out how anti-Asian hate crimes makes us less safe as a country uh, might resonate more. Um, and so I wondered if you could tease that out and, and what your thoughts on that would be. Um, well, let me say, there are two bills that are going through uh, the, the House and in the Senate, they might combine those bills. Uh, the two bills are the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act, which is uh, Hirono and Meng's bill. Uh, it would designate an officer of the Justice Department to facilitate expedited re reviews of hate crimes and also issue guidance for state and local law enforcement. The No Hate Act um, is an act that would fix our flawed hate crime system in the United States. Believe it or not, since 1990, we've had a a uh, federal law which required the FBI to track and tabulate hate crimes. Uh, but there has been very little cooperation with it. It's toothless. Uh, and the reason is that they, re they rely on voluntary data being given to them by local law enforcement. Out of the 15,000 local law enforcement agencies, only 15% of them report anything to the FBI. So we have really failed actually in terms of reporting, but also there are many local law enforcement that don't even have a hate crimes officer or any training for any officer in their unit. So uh, this provides grants for local law enforcement to provide such programs. Well, as you can see, these are really important things. We not need to improve the state of, um, of uh, what we do about hate crimes in this country. And so that's why these bills need to pass. Um, in the Senate, they need 10 more Republicans. Now, I am happy to say that um, the No Hate Act, um, I'm one of the co-leads of that one. And what we do is we have two Democrat co-leads and two Republican co-leads. Um, so it is actually bipartisan. Uh, and in the last Congress, we had 15 Republicans. Whether that translates to 10 Republicans in the Senate, we don't know, but we are right on the cusp. And so what we need are those of you who do have influence with any Republican Senator or Congress member to talk to them about how important this is to you. That it's important that we take a step forward, that we send a signal, that we improve the state of hate crime enforcement in this country, uh, but that also that they stand with the Asian Pacific Islander community. This is great. Thank you. Final question uh, before we close is, you know, and you touched on this already a little bit, but how do you think Asian Americans should work with other minority communities such as Muslim Americans, Sikh Americans, you know, who, who face retributive, you know, violence uh, after 9-11 um, in order to condemn blanket demonization of other countries such as China? What, what should our community be doing? It's so important for us to stand together. And so um, one thing I'm very, very proud of is that we have something called the Tri-Caucus in Congress, which consists of the Congressional Black Caucus, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, and the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. And we worked on, together on everything from hate crimes to voting rights to health care. Well, I can tell you that when the George Floyd uh, killing happened, uh, I was the one actually that organized our tri-caucus press conference so that uh, we could support the black community in getting justice uh, in light of all these uh, police brutality uh, killings. Um, but as soon as the, the hate crimes against Asians started heating up, they supported us with no hesitation with press conferences, with statements, with support for our, our hate crimes bills. And so we have to be models for others. Uh, this is also why I'm the sponsor of the No Ban Act, which um, 
would uh, eliminate any kind of Muslim ban in the future. And uh, I think that it's important. It was it's so important for us to show that we as a community will not stand for um, discrimination against people of other colors, but also of other religions. It's so important for us to stand together. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Um, I just want to thank again the National Committee for this opportunity um, and uh, I look forward to uh, hearing Bernice uh, close us out. So thank you. Thanks, Jessica. And first, a huge thank you to Congresswoman Chu. It's been such a delight and honor to have you on with us tonight. And to our thoughtful panelists, Ian and Jessica, and our excellent moderator, Erica, thank you so much. And I also want to thank my National Committee colleagues who made this program possible. And of course, thank you to the audience for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed the program and found it informative. So thanks again. Take care, everyone, and have a great rest of your evening or day.